When these worms start devouring everything in their path, ferry crossings, huge piers, and even ships are doomed. And if this worm is hungry and there's only a small snail nearby, well, the shell will be the only thing left of it. Why are terrible creatures so essential for our world? Where did the snail of iron come from? Why did Darwin cut worms in pieces? And how did snails get long-range weapons? Let's find out now. Take a close look at this creature. It looks both like a worm and a hammerhead shark, and it's a ferocious predator. The worm seems harmless, but did you notice how intensely the snail started twisting its body? It looks like it's trying to flee. But how do you do it if you're a snail? The worm catches up with the prey, wraps itself around it, and sucks its insides. All of them. All that's left from the snail is an empty shell. And the first question that comes to mind is, how can a worm do something like that? I don't know what you think of that, but for me, such creatures generally don't look like predators. It's one thing when we talk of cheetahs, moray eels, eagles, even Venus flytraps, but worms? However, their world is an incredibly violent place with its own supervillains. Bipallium, aka the hammerhead worm, is a real land predator, with length ranging from only 2 to 8 inches, some species even reach 16 inches, but this is not the point here. Unlike many other worms, it has a well-defined head which resembles a hammer or a mushroom, depending on which species you come across. But this mushroom came up with a perfect hunting strategy. First, worms find prey with the help of chemoreceptors, the sensors quite sensitive to different chemicals. Then the predator tracks down the prey. Usually that's not too challenging, since the creatures on its menu are very clumsy, and then pushes them, covering them in slime. Imagine you're immersed in a very sticky jelly. The prey of the hammerhead worm feels something like that, once the prey is immobilized, the worm averts the pharynx from its body and secretes digestive enzymes, and then sucks the already digested prey into the intestines with the help of cilia. When digestion is complete, the worm's mouth also acts as its anus. Well, quite a multi-purpose tool. Actually, this is a very convenient way to eat creatures like snails. If you've ever tried oysters, then you know what I'm talking about. You need to slurp them. To be honest, this is not to my taste. But essentially, hammerhead worms do the same thing. Moreover, there are snakes from the Perius genus that have also mastered this skill. Some of them have become experts in the field of eating snails and can do this right after birth. First, this snake would bite through the snail shell and then suck out the contents. I hope they at least taste good. Okay, but snakes can be quite big. You don't need to remind me of just how large their prey can get. What about worms? Do their victims have to be small enough not to fight back? Ha! Huh. Bipallium adventitium can attack prey weighing more than a hundred times its own weight. It's as if a human would try eating African elephants by simply walking up to them and biting on their legs. And that would actually work. Other types of flatworms are so good at hunting, they can even eat giant African snails. By the way, using flatworms, people are trying to fight invasive species like giant African snails. But there's a problem. These worms are not particularly picky about the size and eat any snails they come across. That is, they destroy both invasive and native species. Actually, have you seen giant African snails? They're just huge. Can't such big creatures fight back some worms? Has nature deliberately made all snails weak so that everyone else can hunt them? Well, perhaps. Unless we speak of scaly foot snails. When Steve told me about snails of iron, I thought they were just another weird comic book superhero. But no, they actually exist. The scaly foot snail is a gastropod that lives near hydrothermal vents and is the only known organism whose skeleton contains iron. The foot of the animal is covered with special plates containing iron and the shell is divided into three layers, with the outer one also covered by iron sulfide. Apparently, this design was inherited by the scaly foot snail from distant ancestors 500 million years ago. Many ancient animals defended themselves like that. Because iron really works, a snail can remain completely unharmed after an attack by predators like crabs. The latter can clamp down a strong shell for several days, but it won't break. And also, apparently, these snails are magnetic. I'm serious. That's what the sources tell.
But the iron shell not only protects against crabs and withstands strong force, some predatory snails hunt by firing harpoons into the flesh of fish and other snails and injecting venom. It's believed that the plates of the scaly foot snail kind of deflect these projectiles, just like knightly armor deflects a spear. Wait a minute. Do you mean snails have spears? Steve! Steve, I don't get it. Care to explain? Hm, I got it all figured out. Cone snails, predatory gastropod mollusks, do have spears, or rather harpoons. They once developed them from their teeth. Through this harpoon, the mollusks inject venom into the prey, which completely immobilizes it, and then, using the same harpoon, they pull the prey towards themselves. By the way, the venom of large cone snails is also dangerous for humans, although they aren't going to eat us. Today, at least 30 human deaths are known to be caused by the venom of cone snails. But let's leave the venomous mollusks alone. Someday I'll probably make a video about them. They are quite fascinating creatures. For now, let's go back to worms. Because hammerhead worms don't just feed on snails. Their menu also includes earthworms. Once captured by the hammerhead snail, they of course also begin to react to the attack, but the predator uses the muscles of its body, as well as sticky secretions, to attach itself to the earthworm. Basically, the hammerhead worm simply disorients the prey, and soon it becomes too late. And although this is a completely natural process, the eating habits of hammerhead worms can cost us all dearly. But more on that later. The first flatworms were discovered by Charles Darwin. Back then, he took several worms with him on board the Beagle. And as all scientists of that time, he began to experiment on unknown creatures. Well, that was his job. Wait! I need to describe you! Hell no! I know what comes next! Darwin cut the worms in half and discovered that 25 days later, each part regenerated to almost complete animals. That is, two worms came out of one. The famous scientist didn't even suspect that soon these very worms would become an invasive species ready to take over the planet. Back then, he was just surprised and, well, I hope he didn't taste the worms. But let's face the obvious. Many animals can be destroyed if they're cut into pieces. But not flatworms. Since they reproduce by splitting, cutting the worm is making its job easier. Even if you cut off the head of the creature, it'll simply emerge as two worms and will continue to live. A piece of flatworm without a tail and a head can become a full-fledged organism in just three weeks. In three weeks? It takes much more time for people to recover from injuries. In the first week, two tiny spots appear on a piece of worm. These are the new eyes grown from scratch. The rest of the piece still looks like a blob. By day 12, the blob already has a new head and tail, both are translucent. Another week later, they assume their usual color, and by the end of the third week, the worm can already eat. That is, it's fully regenerated. But you know what really surprised me? Flatworms don't just regenerate, they also share their memory. That is, if you cut off the head of one worm, soon you'll have two worms, and they'll both have identical memory. Scientists tested this in the lab by first training the worms to travel to a certain area to get food, and then splitting them, well, literally, into pieces. Turned out the memory survived even after such a procedure. Basically, if you consider this fact, it's clear how hammerhead worms quickly became an invasive species. The first visiting Bipallium kiwince worm species was discovered in the Kew Botanic Gardens on the outskirts of London back in 1878. Native to Southeast Asia, this land flatworm got there on a merchant ship and has since spread across most of the planet. First, the worms colonized all sorts of greenhouses and indoor gardens, then they got out into the fresh air where the climate was fitting. Scientists agree the worm spread so far mostly thanks to their ability to reproduce by splitting. Did human attempts to exterminate them only help the worms? Who knows? This is not the most important point here. The danger of invasive species is not only that they multiply rapidly, they drive out or destroy native species. And this can lead to disaster, even when it comes to earthworms. On the one hand, eh, who cares about earthworms anyway? They just crawl somewhere in the soil. But on the other hand, it's earthworms that make the soil the way it is. They fertilize it, constantly loosen it, restore it, mix it up, distributing nutrients, and even clean it of heavy metals. Also, earthworms are a food source for many animals. There's a reason environmentalists call earthworms the keystone species. If they're gone, this will affect the entire planet. It might even lead to a mass extinction. Now, take time to process that. 
Everything around us depends on worms that are threatened by other worms. Right now, in a very, very small world, there's a battle for the future of our planet. Although, in fact, worms caused damage to humans long before Darwin discovered these guys with hammer-like heads. I'm talking about chipworms. Imagine the world in the 19th century. Most important things are made of wood, including ships. However, water is home to shipworms, which are in fact bivalves that eat wood. And not just eat, they devour it greedily and uncontrollably. Although shipworms appeared long before mankind mastered seafaring, it was us who carried them around the world by traveling. Don't forget we still use wooden piles for piers, lower them into the water, proving a lunch buffet for the shipworms. That's what happened in San Francisco. Nature magazine estimated the damage caused by shipworms in the bay between 1917 and 1921 at $25 million. That's more than $300 million today. Since the gold rush times, 650 ships have been abandoned in the bay. Most of them were eaten by shipworms, turning the wood into a kind of sponge. The worms undermined piles, destroyed piers, sometimes even brought down houses. Sometimes destruction happened terrifyingly fast. One large wharf, pier, or ferry crossing disappeared every two weeks. But the most interesting thing is that this battle between humans and shipworms never really ended. We figured out how to treat wood, learned how to use a variety of chemicals, replace wood with more durable materials, but the worms have not gone anywhere. They're still happy to bite into any tree that gets into the water. Let's just hope they don't figure out how to eat iron. See you later.